Welcome to the program. This is What's Your Story. My name is Catherine Mwangi. Today we're here at the Trademark Hotel situated at the Village Market in Nairobi. And we are privileged to be speaking to Dr. Manoj Shah. He's the chairman of the Kingswood Group of Companies. They've invested heavily in automobile, real estate, healthcare, and so much more. He's also a member and a global leader of the Lions Clubs International. And we cannot wait to share this story with you. He's launching his biography today, One in a Million, and it's my privilege, as I hope it will be yours, to get to know his story on this program, What's Your Story? Let's go meet him. Dr. Manoj Shah, thank you so very much for thank coming. Thank you for inviting me. This, this book, first of all, it's, it's beautiful, let me say that. Thank you. I, I, love, I love the cover, I love the title, One in a Million. Yes. Just reading it this week, I understood what the author, the autobiographer, uh, Sandeep Malu. Yes. I understood this, this title, One in a Million. But Great. before we go there, your company, as chairman of um, Kingsway Group of Companies, you currently employ over 4,000 yes. people. 4,000? Yes. You're basically the Donald Trump of this region. <laughs> <laughs> your father started Kingsway Tires and handed it over to you when he fell sick and, and passed on years ago. And you brought that company from there to here. What has that journey been like? That journey has been uh, a journey of a lot of trials and tribulations. Uh, it's not been easy because when you lose your father at a very tender age of 16 or 17 years, it's very difficult to stand up on your own feet and try and make it in the real world. But with the support of the Almighty and of course with the blessings and support of my mother and my two brothers, that's how we have managed to build up the empire that we are enjoying today. Yes. The very many various businesses that we have set up yes. in the last 40 years that have all been as a result of sheer dedication, devotion and hard work. Yes. A key pillar that I you know, came across from your biography is how solid and stable and loving your family is. Your family speaks incredibly highly of you, you know, your wife, uh, your two daughters, Priyam and Soyam. And family is a big, big deal and a very integral part to your success. Yes. What role have, have they played? My family has played a very critical role in my personal success of whatever I've accomplished over the last 40 years. But at the same time, I'm a firm believer that if you keep your family together, if the family is happy, and if there is cohesion and teamwork and support from your entire family, there is no way you can fail in this world by of doing anything that you wish or choose to do. Yeah. Tell me a bit about your wife, Jaina. My wife, Jaina, uh, is, is a fantastic person. Uh, she's been my soulmate for over 37 years, and she has actually been the true pillar behind all my successes. Hmm. Like the saying goes, behind every successful man, there is a woman. Yeah. Whether it means serving him a hot cup of tea and making sure he gets his breakfast on time, to supporting me in all my endeavors, yeah. in my good times, in my bad times, and in times that I've had my lows, because everybody goes through their lows. And she has been a phenomenal support to me. Hmm. especially during those times when I really needed her to support me, hold my hand and walk with me through this journey. Hmm. So she's been incredible and the, I can never be, ever be so grateful to her for the support that she has extended to me in my journey. That's beautiful to hear because most, most, um, most men who enjoy stupendous success like you do you find they soar by themselves and they leave the family behind. Yes. But in your case, it's not just your family, it's not just your wife and, and your daughters, but also your extended family, your brothers. There's yes. a very close-knittedness there. 
Yes. Has that helped in perhaps um, stabilizing the empire that's the Kingsway group? Certainly. Mm. And in fact, I would like to pay tribute to my two brothers. I am the middle of the two brothers. Although I was the first one to enter the business after my father passed away and I took over, mm. my elder brother was studying in the UK and I did not want to disrupt his studies. So I allowed him to finish his studies uh, and then to come back and join me and hold my hand. My young brother was still in high school and I really wanted him also uh, to fulfill his dream and yeah. his career. Yeah. But nevertheless, my elder brother came, held my hand. My younger brother, after a couple of years, also came in. And together, all three of us were the fantastic trio that attributed to the success of building all our businesses as a family. Yes. Not only building the businesses, but keeping the family together intact. And what is the most gratifying part of my family is that each of my brothers have a different set skill. Mm. And what they bring to the table and all three of us combined are a phenomenal force uh, in achieving whatever we have achieved so far. Yes, that is beautiful. I read also you have a way in which you solve conflicts because conflicts are inevitable uh, with families. Yes. But you come together. You don't let things just stew yes. and go unsolved. So conflicts are there, especially in extended families. And today our family is 30 plus. We have 30 plus family members in our immediate extended family. Mm -hmm. And when you have a family of that size, you certainly have conflicts in yes. the family. And for me, it's not about knowing that there is a conflict. It's about finding the right solutions and how to resolve those conflicts. Because if those conflicts are not addressed, if they are not confronted, and if they are not resolved, it can disrupt a good family. Yeah. And that can also impact and affect the business that you are running You're for right. the family. You're right. I love it. So how did you move Kingsway um, attire business into this conglomerate that it is now in this region and globally? So my father initially started the attire business uh, in 1960. In fact, we are celebrating 64 years next week wow. of the family attire business that my father started. And uh, that was his core passion. And he started from a very humble beginning of putting up a shop on Kingsway Road. Mm -hmm. And this was pre-independence. Before Where was independence, this? it was on it is now called the University Way. Uh -huh. And that was the former Kingsway police station where he bought a prison cell that was empty. And in the prison cell, he started a small duka of tires. And that mm -hmm. is the history and the humble beginning from where we grew our empire. From a prison cell? From a prison cell on the former Kingsway Road, which is now today called University Way. It was called the Kingsway. Yes. The road itself was called the Kingsway mm. in so the British the colonial times. Mm. And that's where the name of our group derived from. Oh my goodness. Prison cell? Yes. And now you're all over the world. <laughs> and now, basically, we have expanded our business uh, through all the counties in Kenya, in East Africa. And of course, we work globally and internationally. Mm. And you, have, you are a heavy investor in the healthcare sector um, with the two, two of the biggest hospitals we have in, 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 um, in Kenya. That's Mpisha Hospital and uh, Lion's Eye. Yes. And I read in the book uh, your wife's testimony saying that even in the middle of the night, you'd get a call and you'd go and serve yes. without question. Yes. <laughs> in the middle of the night. In fact, it's been a, a trying journey. Uh, being the chairman of the Mpisha Hospital mm -hmm. is not an easy job. And running a medical institution, and especially during the COVID times, the last 15 months, it's been a non-stop affair, trying to help people, trying to help save lives, trying to mitigate the many challenges that we have had during COVID. Mm. And that also entails people calling you right in the wee hours of the morning or midnight, asking for help, asking for assistance. 
and seeing how they can get help in the hospital. And uh, for me, it's my job. It's the most gratifying thing that I can do to help somebody at his dire time of need. Hmm. And I love doing it. I never complain. And I always tell my wife, keep on waking me up no matter what time it is or no matter how cold it is. Yeah. Uh, but I really want to go out there. And, and if I can help and make a difference, I would love to do that. You're described as a helper who does it with a smile and without complaining. Yes. That has been your attitude all through life. Absolutely. One of the things that I've learned to do is to look at life with a positive attitude. And whenever you look at things with a positive attitude, you make the other person very comfortable. And that in itself solves 50% of the pro problem that the other person has, whoever is talking to you. Hmm. So a conglomerate that employs over 4,000 Kenyans, uh, 4,000 people at this point in time, how do you run it? How do you ensure that everything is running as it should? So over the years, we have mastered the art of management. Uh, we have brought in key people, professional management. We have trained a lot of our uh, staff mm -hmm. in our various businesses mm -hmm. to run the business. And we do have a number of consultants who have been working with us over the years, helping us structure our business and helping us manage this business effectively. Hmm. And at the same time, the family still has control over all the businesses that we run. Yes. There's a schedule that you have every morning you go through all the companies and how they're doing. Yes. I read that here. It's very orderly. Yes. So nothing, no ball is dropped. Yes, absolutely right. Uh, being at the now at the key management level and being at the board level, of course, I do not involve myself with the day to day mm -hmm. affairs of running each company. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, historically, I've always been a person on the ground. I love my reports that come in every morning, the dashboards that each of the businesses send to me in the morning. I go through them. I see the performance of what each business is doing and I make it a point that every week by rotation, I try and visit each one of my businesses myself, personally, physically on the ground. Talk to the people, talk to the management and see what is happening on the ground and help them with any problems or challenges that they may have. That's amazing. I mean, where do you find the time? Those, are, those businesses are quite many. Dr. Shah. One of the things that a lot of people tell me is that how do I manage my time uh, between my various business manage businesses that we run and also my other social interactions with the hospitals and the other social work that I do. But it's all to do with time management. Hmm. And this is something that I have learned to ma again master over the years. How do I manage my time effectively? And in fact, if you ask me, what my diary looks like for the next two weeks, I can count it on my fingertips and tell you where I'm going to be, what meetings I'm going to attend, which of my businesses that I'm going to look after, and which of the social engagements that I am going to take care of. Wow. And besides that, I also include the time when I'm going to exercise okay. and possibly get a little bit of time to enjoy playing a little bit of golf. Yes, with your friends. With my friends. So how has your company been able to stay afloat in a tough economic environment that we have seen as a country maybe for the last however many years? You have been able to, to stay afloat and to be a winner on all sectors, on all fronts. What are those ingredients? So one of the things that uh, we have actually instilled into many of our businesses is a sustainability model. Mm -hmm. And the sustainability model has helped us during turbulent times that we have seen in the country, especially over the last 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. So we have put in checks and measures. Uh, we have actually got a formulation that is there to sustain our business in the event that the environment is not conducive to that event. Okay. So just to give you an example, yes, please. Uh, for the last 15 months, we, have, we all know that COVID has impacted upon a lot of things and impacted upon a lot of lives. Mm. And so has our business has been impacted. Mm -hmm. We run two hotels uh, in the city of Nairobi. Mm -hmm. One is the trademark hotel that we are sitting in and one is the tribe hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, tribe hotel has been there in existence for almost 17 years. 
But as the pandemic broke last year in March, we made a very bold decision to shut down the hotel in the month of April because there was no occupancy. And unfortunately, we had to let 600 of our staff go home. Now that hotel till today, 15 months down the line, is still shut down. But what we have done is we have found a sustainable model mm -hmm. of how to manage our cost in that hotel, how to keep our staff who have been sent home happy and at least able to sustain themselves and their families. And at the same time, to make sure that how can we derive some income from that hotel by hol holding private conferences, meetings, weddings, hmm. so that we can generate a little bit of income to sustain the overheads and the cost yeah. that are associated with the hotel. Yes. So these are some of the mitigating factors that we have taken uh, in charge of yes. to make sure that whenever we have turbulent times, we can sustain and manage our businesses. Wow. You know, um, the biography speaks about your kindness and generosity. And just now, just hearing you say that you didn't just let your staff go, you found ways in which to support and to help them, even when the hotel is closed. I mean, most hotels just let people go until further notice. But you, took care, you take your staff as though they were family, an extended family. Absolutely. So what we have done in the uh, turbulent times that mm. COVID has impacted upon, we have taken care of our staff and their families. Those who have been able to find other means of sustaining themselves, we have allowed them to do so. Mm. Those who have not, we as a CSR, a corporate social initiative, and as being responsible employers, we have made sure that we give them a sustainable allowance. And at the same time, we have also set up our own Sokoni for our staff, our own supermarket wow. for our staff. It is located here at the Trademark Hotel in our warehouses, uh -huh. where we have bulk bought a lot of essential foods, groceries that the staff needs on a regular basis. And we allow them to come in and buy them at cost price, which helps them. And those of the staff members who cannot afford, we give it to them in anticipation that when things get better, they will be able to pay back. That is what we have done for the welfare of our staff. My goodness. <laughs> I should just clap. <laughs> That's absolutely... And not only that. Yeah. We have also made a medical provision and we have a full-time standby clinical officer in the event that our staff or their families need any medical help. Uh, we also help them in this Access time. Access it. That is phenomenal. I have not had that from anywhere else okay. uh, here, at least. That is phenomenal. Wow, that is amazing. So for you, it's not just about... Um, I actually, again, read it. <laughs> I'll keep referring to, sure, it, to sure, your sure. biography, which uh, just don't forget this is launching today. You, they're having a family launch today. Congratulations. And a bigger launch, you'll tell us when. But uh, I read uh, in your biography that when you have a business just for the sake of money, then that's a poor business because it's not True. just supposed to be about money. True. Mm. So what we have done is... Uh, Coming from a philanthropic family and my mother being a firm believer of Mother Teresa, my mother had actually had the opportunity of working with Mother Teresa and she was a volunteer oh. mm -hmm. at the Mother Teresa's home. And whilst I was young, I was inspired by my mother that whatever you make, you must share it with others. And that's the philosophy of our company. So what we have done in our group of companies is we have set up a foundation which is called the Kingsway Foundation mm -hmm. and it is the foundation through the support of all our companies that supports the welfare of many needy Kenyans in this country. And over the years we do have a lot of welfare programs, a lot of corporate social responsibility projects and activities that we support on an ongoing basis and that's how we try and help as many of our Kenyan brothers and sisters as possible. Wow, incredible. Why do companies fail? When we talk about companies, and I'll talk about family businesses, uh, 
because that's where I have a lot of experience in and that's another area that I've now started helping mm -hmm. a lot of family businesses such as ours. Mm -hmm. A lot of family business that I've seen do fail uh, for a couple of reasons. One is poor management and they've not been able to restructure as they grow. When a business is small, it's easier to manage. But as you grow your business, and if you don't keep up the managing part of managing your extended and growing business, mm. that's a recipe for failure. Mm. One other area, as far as family businesses that actually are suffering, and I've seen quite a number of them uh, in our country of Kenya, is because of the misalignment of family members, the structuring of how family members work into a family business, their varied roles, because not all five fingers are the same, and not all five family members are the same. And working with a family is the most difficult thing that you can do, especially in a growing business. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the main reasons why family businesses fail. Mm. And the recipe for that is to restructure the family part of it and the business automatically grows and shines. Mm. Looking at various other businesses uh, that have failed over time, many of them is because of overextended growth that they have without the available resources. So whenever a business grows, you must keep up with the resources for that growing business. Money is very, very important, but so is manpower, which is equally important. And so is all other resources for that business to keep on growing. Yeah. Hmm. So that's another very big reason why a lot of other businesses fail. Yeah, so you have managed to secure uh, Kingswood Group from all of those forces, you have yes. been able to secure the company. What is the future for, for Kingsway before we go to the future for yourself, though it appears like you have done everything <laughs> but for Kingsway? What are your dreams for it? Uh, my, my dream for the Kingsway group of companies is that the Kingsway group of companies is going to flourish for generations to flow. We already have the third generation family business members in the business and I'm hoping that the business will be there for the fourth generation and looking at the expansion of our business we definitely want to expand our business into various other fields and subsectors okay. okay and my other final dream for my business is that it will be able to support the Kingsway Foundation the corporate social responsibility arm of the Kingsway group of companies Hmm. that will also be able to assist the needy and less fortunate members of our society. So everything for you gravitates towards supporting yes. those who do not have. Yes. That's, you feel like that's your life calling? Absolutely. At this point of time in my life, uh, that's the only thing that I really want to do and that's my desire to try and help as many people in this country as possible. Because I've accomplished a lot. I've gone through a lot in my family life. I've achieved whatever I had to achieve. I can only give back. Hmm. And I want to give back willingly. Yes, and joyfully. And joyfully. And joyfully. <laughs> well, I see the smile. So for now, Dr. Shah, we'll take a short commercial break. Sure. When we come back, we'll be speaking to Dr. Shah about his work with the Lions Clubs International and also get to glean from his wisdom on how to just live life as a young person, as a married couple, as a father and as a friend after the break. Welcome back. This is What's Your Story. We are here today at the Trademark Hotel located in the Village Market, Nairobi. And we are privileged to be speaking to Dr. Manot Shah, a stupendously successful man, not just in Nairobi, but globally, a globally renowned name, a member and a leader of Lions Clubs International. Right. Tell us about your work with Lions. First, what is Lions? So Lions Clubs International is the world's largest service club organization. And for the last 10 years, it has been ranked as the number one non-governmental organization in the world by the New York Times. Wow. We have about 
1.5 million lions represented in more than 210 countries around the world and the whole objective of lions clubs and lions members in Kenya and around the world is to bring hope and help those who need help and the communities that are challenged. Hmm. So that is the work that lions do around the world and in Kenya. Yeah, so when one is called a lion, what, what does that mean? So a lion is a symbolic a name for a member that is represented by the Lions Clubs International. Mm. And Lions stands for Liberty, Intelligence, Our Nation's Safety. Oh, it's an acronym. It's an acronym. Liberty? Liberty. Intelligence? Intelligence, uh -huh. Our Nation's Safety. Ah, so it's even Lions, not just la I just, <laughs> I don't know. I have never, I just hear Lions. So is Lions the same? Or is it different from the Rotary Club? It's similar. Oh, it's the same. It's, it's a similar organization, okay. like our sister club organization, Rotary mm. Club. And both of us have the same objectives to help the less privileged members of our society. So tell me about your work, because it is extensively biographed here yes. with the Lions. So I've been working with the Lions Clubs International for the last 37 years. Uh, and 37 years ago, I embraced and I became a member of a local Lions Club in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've never looked back. I've always enjoyed being a part of the Lions fraternity in Kenya. And in my journey of being a Lion member in Kenya, it's taken me to another level of being a leader of Lions Clubs International at the world level, at the international level. Wow. Uh, I grew up and I climbed the ladder of becoming the international director of Lions Clubs International. And today, I am also a leader of Africa. Wow. So I do give leadership uh, to many lions in many African countries. I help them develop projects and activities to help the needy and less fortunate members of our society. Mm. My goodness. So, because I also read one of your brothers, I'm not sure that it's Manisha or Sanjay, who wishes that you be the president of the Lions International. So you're a step to that? Yes. <laughs> well, I do have one more final step to go uh, before becoming the international Overall. president of Lions Clubs. But I do have a desire and ambition and God willing, uh, one day I may be able to give leadership to the entire world of uh, Lions Clubs International. But that is such a big deal, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is, for sure. But even where you are now, it's still such a big deal, international director. That's right. So what are some of the works or projects that you have done here locally? We have uh, done a lot of work in Kenya, uh, as far as Lions Clubs International are concerned. And one of our key projects is the Lions Sight First Eye Hospital, where over the last 21 years that the hospital has been in existence, we have managed to serve more than 2 million Kenyans and help them to restore their eyesight. Wow. Two if million. we would not have helped them, they would have become blind. So that is one of our projects that we have undertaken uh, in Kenya. The Lion Sight First Eye Hospital is really a temple of service where we have over the years developed many programs and projects that have helped our Kenyans to have their eyesight restored, and we have also helped many of them also not going blind. In fact, we are the only hospital in East and Central Africa that has an eye bank. And what is an eye bank? An eye bank is how do we store human tissue in an eye bank and transplant it to those who need it? And just to give you a very simple example, a lot of people, especially children, young adults, uh, whenever they're playing, they get hurt because the ball goes into their eyes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or a stick goes into their eyes. Yeah. And it's like the windscreen of your car. So when you look at the windscreen of your car, in your eye, you have a windscreen. And in your car, if you throw a stone at your windscreen, the windscreen gets shattered. And the same thing happens to your eyes. So what we do is we take a tissue of somebody who is demised and we transplant it into a person 
who needs it. And the procedure that we do at our hospital is 100% successful. And over the years, we have helped restore the eyesight of over 6,000 children, young adults, and of course, adults who have needed this surgery. And we are the only people who do it in Kenya. My God. And wow. besides that, we also have a beautiful program in helping our children, mm -hmm. especially in villages and rural schools. And we are the only people or the only organization in Kenya that is running a program like this. And what we have seen, especially in villages and rural schools, is that a lot of children go into schools. And of course, as we all know that many of the schools are overwhelmed. You have 60 students in a class, 80 students in a class, you have one teacher, uh, and it's an overwhelming situation yeah. in many of the uh, schools, especially yeah. outside the big city of Nairobi. And many of these students sometimes don't perform well. And when they don't perform well, because their parents are not educated at home, they can't understand why the children or the child, the boy or the girl, is not performing well. Mm. And they only think that, you know, the child is not putting in effort. The teacher being a teacher is so overwhelmed, uh, she has no time to try and understand why the child is not doing well. Mm. But if the child cannot read a book or see the blackboard, how do we expect the child to progress? So usually the child is put at the back of the classroom and that's the end of that child's yeah. career. Yeah. So what we do is we go into schools, we educate teachers on how to screen children who have visual problems. So that's the first thing that we do. And then we screen children mm. and you'll be surprised. We find a lot of children who just need simple eyeglasses to correct their eyesight and be able to read books and look at the blackboard and it transforms their lives. Oh. We also find a lot of children that have squint eyes or problems with their eyes that need a little bit of corrective surgery that we do at our hospital free of charge. And once you do that, they become outstanding students. So that is another program that we have started at the Lions Site First Eye Hospital. Yeah. <laughs> This, I mean, everything you, you, you keep, everything you're saying with every answer just gives us such a deep level of respect for you. I mean, what you're doing is phenomenal. Thank you. Phenomenal. So, Dr. Shah, uh, when it comes to your family, you were just, you've just talked about uh, the children and, and your daughters are very fond of you, yes. uh, as has been shown uh, in the book. And what are some of the values that they have gleaned from you or you have instilled in them as pertaining what you do now? Because I know you, this is, your life is a legacy. I think one of them actually even said that. Your life is a legacy, not just to them, but to communities around the world. What are those values as a father you have instilled in your children that other fathers watching can emulate? I've been very fortunate that uh, I have two lovely daughters and both my lovely daughters have followed my footstep. And since a very young age, I've instilled the art or the concept of giving back to the society in both my daughters. Mm. And I've also given them good values of life. And today I'm extremely proud talking about my young daughter she is actually a copyright of me, and she has started following my footsteps. Not only her ambition and her desire to become an entrepreneur and a successful businesswoman, but also becoming a philanthropist. Yeah. And at a very young age of 30 years, just two weeks ago, she was given a doctorate in humanities by an American university for her contribution to the society. Wow. And wow. she has actually taken up the challenge and footsteps of becoming a Lion member. She's formed her own Lions Clubs and she has actually formed a Lions Club with a cause to help people suffer who are suffering with diabetes. Mm. And that's the challenge that she has taken up globally. And she's also taken up the challenge of mentoring the youth. Wow. And uh, her desire is to do something even better than what I have done. It's amazing. Talking about my elder daughter, at a very young age, 
Obviously, she wanted to become a professional. She wanted to become a businesswoman. Uh, I did mentor her. And somewhere along the line, I'm so proud of her that she changed her career. And today, she's an accomplished medical doctor, married to a medical doctor, working in a very successful medical practice in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And she wants to specialize into a very uh, specific medical field. Mm -hmm. And she wants to come back to Kenya and open her own clinic to help our Kenyans here. My goodness. You must be a proud daddy. I am. I am proud of both my daughters. How did they get here? What, what are these values that fathers need to know so that they don't give up on their children? Because raising children is not easy for anybody. But yours have managed to be so successful in the paths that they have individually chosen. It's the way that I have communicated with them since they were young. Mm. And one of the things that I realized as a responsible father that I must talk less and listen more. Uh, because if I listen to them, I can understand what they want to do, where they want to go, and it also gives me an opportunity to support them in a much better way if I listen to them and I understand their point of view. My and that is something that I learned and at a very young age. And I started listening to them. I started giving them a free hand. I started giving them those opportunities at a very young age to do whatever they thought was best for them. Hmm. In addition to that, I also made it a point that as far as family values are concerned, the biggest family value values come from your grandmother. Uh -huh. And that's where the family values of how a family should stay together, live together, work together, look after the siblings who come in after them, how that should be done. Hmm. And I must attribute that to their grandmother, my mother, yes. who has instilled those true family values in them. Hmm. And in terms of their career growth, uh, I believe that I've been their best counsellor. Uh, I've been their best inspirator and motivator yeah. in guiding them and being their light to the path that they wanted to follow. Mm. And I've always wished them to be successful. Yes, that's, that's beautiful. For kids who come from broken families, um, where they don't have that kind of parental support, and you find most are struggling, yes. or most are in that state of despondency, what would you tell such children? So most of those children, what I would tell them is that they need help. If they can't get help from their parents, because a lot of parents do not know how to handle children, we do have a lot of groups outside there who can help them, who can counsel them, who can mentor them, and put them on the right path. Mm and help them to accomplish and achieve their dreams. Mm. One of the things that I did with my young girls when I started as an exercise mm -hmm. was I asked them to put up their dream book when they were 10 years old. I told them to make another dream book when they were 20 years old. And believe me, in the dream book, they actually put in where they wanted to go and what they wanted to accomplish. And it actually gave you an understanding of what their thinking was. Oh. So with a lot of these kids who are out there who do not have the opportunity like my girls had. Yeah. I would like to encourage them to look at counseling or to look at support groups that are out there who can help them. Hmm. One of the things that I've done over the years besides my two girls mm -hmm. is I've mentored a lot of youth. Uh, I do that on a regular basis mm -hmm. and on a continuous basis I have at least six or eight youth who come to me on a regular basis, talk to me, chat to me, and I guide them, I inspire them, I motivate them, I put them on the right path. Yes. And the only reason why I do that, because I know the pa their parents can't do it. Hmm. And that's why they've come to me. Yes. They've come for some hope. They see some light at the end of the yes. day. Yes. And I, I, I look at it as my responsibility, that if I've done it for my daughters, why can't I do it for more young people who need that help? Hmm. That's phenomenal. So with this book... What is your hope for this book? Let me first, let me just tell you, this is a book you need to get. This is a book you need to read. 
I, I promise you, I said to you this year, I won't bombard you with, with books. I'll just be very, very careful which books that I recommend. So far, I've recommended one, International. This is the first local book okay. I am recommending. Yes. It's phenomenal. Thank what you. are your hopes with this biography? The whole intent and purpose of writing my autobiography was actually threefold. First was to actually record all the accomplishments that I have made during my young days and put them into a format and leave it as a legacy for my future generations. Because if I don't do that, I don't think my next two generations will ever remember what I have done or what I've accomplished. Yeah. Secondly, I wanted to inspire the corporate world that with every struggle, there is always a hope. Mm. With every fight, there is always a winner and a loser. Mm -hmm. And after a lot of rainfall, there is always a beautiful rainbow out there. And that is what I wanted to demonstrate through my book, that whilst you go through all your trials and tribulations, there is that beautiful rainbow that you see at the end of the day after the storm yeah. that makes it worthwhile for you to be who you are. Hmm. And my third reason of writing this book is to inspire the young generation, to inspire youth who want to make it out there for tomorrow. That how can they do it? I have done it. I've given a lot of examples in my book. Uh, and from that, it will make a good learning for them. Yeah. And I'm hoping that it will inspire and motivate them that if I can do it, they can do it also. Hmm. It does all of those and more. It yes. does all of those and more. One reads this book and wonders, where does Dr. Shah find the time to do all of this? Your work with lions has you traveling all over the world. Yes. You have a business empire here. You have a very strong family going. And you also enjoy spending time with friends, you know, just winding down. The management of all of those things. And then it hasn't even aged you. You don't look like you're stressed at all, you know. So, <laughs> so how, where, where do you find the time to be there for people? And when you're busy pouring out and giving out, what pours back into you? So basically, it's a balance between work, life, and social. Hmm. How do you balance all these three elements as you age. Uh, I might look younger, but I have no hair left uh, <laughs> since my younger days. But I've, I've managed to find a work, life and family balance uh, as I've grown older. And I've made it a point in my time management to find a place for each one of these three. So just to talk about my typical day yes. and how I've, I plan my typical day. Mm -hmm. Of course, I wake up early uh, in the morning and I don't go to the office till nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. And I usually dedicate every morning to my businesses mm -hmm. because mornings is the time when the businesses need me and I also need to see what is happening in the various businesses. Yeah. And religiously over the last almost 20 or 25 years, I have made it a point that every morning I give my quality time to each of my businesses in rotation. Mm -hmm. In the afternoons, what I have kind of planned myself mm -hmm. inadvertently after 3 p.m., that is dedicated to my social work in the hospitals and in the Lions Clubs. Mm -hmm. And that is the time that I dedicate to giving whatever I can back to the medical institutions that I represent and to the Lions Clubs that I work for. Mm -hmm. In the evenings, I have kept one hour slot free where I carry out mentorship for young people, youth, people who have issues or problems. I give them that one hour, I give them my time, I give them my ear, whether it is virtually, on the telephone, or even physically, mm. where I talk to them, counsel them, give them advice, or help them you know, sort out their problems. Yeah. And evenings is more or less family time. I make it a point that every evening, at least five times a week, is family time uh, with my wife and my daughters. Mm. So that's how I balance uh, my work life and my social uh, work that I do on a regular basis. And on the weekends? 
So weekends, as I mentioned to you, is time for recreation, mm. social work, uh, you know, play a little bit of golf. Uh, and that's what I do on weekends and wind down and relax. Mm. And I love reading and I do a lot of reading at home also. Yes, amazing. Why, why do companies fail? When we talk about companies and I'll talk about family businesses, uh, because that's where I have a lot of experience in and that's another area that I've now started helping mm. a lot of family businesses such as ours. Mm -hmm. A lot of family business that I've seen do fail uh, for a couple of reasons. One is poor management and they've not been able to restructure as they grow. When a business is small, it's easier to manage. But as you grow your business, and if you don't keep up the managing part of managing your extended and growing business, mm. that's a recipe for failure. Mm. One other area, as far as family businesses that actually are suffering, and I've seen quite a number of them uh, in our country of Kenya, is because of the misalignment of family members, the structuring of how family members work into a family business, their varied roles, because not all five fingers are the same, and not all five family members are the same. And working with a family is the most difficult thing that you can do, especially in a growing business. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the main reasons why family businesses fail. Mm. And the recipe for that is to restructure the family part of it and the business automatically grows and shines. Mm. Looking at various other businesses uh, that have failed over time, many of them is because of overextended growth that they have without the available resources. So whenever a wow. business grows, you must keep up with the resources for that growing business. Money is very, very important, but so is manpower, which is equally important. And so is all other resources for that business to keep on growing. Yeah. Hmm. So that's another very big reason why a lot of other businesses fail. Yes, yes. So you have managed to secure uh, Kingswood Group, from all of those forces, you have yes. been able to secure the company. What is the future for, for Kingsway before we go to the future for yourself, though it appears like you have done everything <laughs> but for Kingsway? What are your dreams for it? Uh, my, my dream for the Kingsway Group of Companies is that the Kingsway Group of Companies is going to flourish for generations to flow. We already have the third generation family business members in the business and I'm hoping that the business will be there for the fourth generation. And looking at the expansion of our business, we definitely want to expand our business into various other fields and subsectors. Okay. Okay. And my other final dream for my business is that it will be able to support the Kingsway Foundation the corporate social responsibility arm of the Kingsway Group of Companies hmm. that will also be able to assist the needy and less fortunate members of our society. So everything for you gravitates towards supporting yes. those who do not have. Yes. That's, you feel like that's your life calling? Absolutely. At this point of time in my life, uh, that's the only thing that I really want to do and that's my desire to try and help as many people in this country as possible. Because I've accomplished a lot, I've gone through a lot in my family life, I've achieved whatever I had to achieve, I can only give back. Hmm. And I want to give back willingly. Yes, and joyfully. And joyfully. And joyfully. <laughs> well, lose with a smile. Oh, lose with a smile. So, for you, as an individual, and I know you've touched a bit about it uh, in terms of what matters to you now in your life, but um, did, you, did you ever see yourself here? Honestly speaking, no. Uh, it all came by accident. It all kind of came by way of me working in different fields. And it actually came through to me that what I should be doing when I started seeing the plight of so many businesses plight of my family and obviously going out in the real world and traveling a lot, 
uh, that has actually transformed my life and inspired me hmm. to do what I'm doing today. Hmm. So your next steps, I mean, to be honest, <laughs> most people would maybe be taking vacations uh, when they've reached the status you have, but you seem to have more drive and fire to want to do more. What's the more? What's the next for you? I was just told by my hospital CEO yesterday uh -huh. that chairman, you need to take a break. <laughs> you have been working 14 months non-stop during this COVID pandemic at the hospital and yeah. now you need to take a break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but fortunate, fortunately for me, my vacation, my break is doing something that I love doing. Which is helping people. Which just is helping people, being out there, doing things and that gives me satisfaction and that's my vacation. <laughs> that's your vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Does because your wife agree with that? I, 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 I can't see myself sitting on a beach, wearing a swimming costume, putting my sunglasses on for eight hours in a day, I'll go mad. So are you saying your vacations are usually very short or they're not at a beach? <laughs> no, no, I, I do have vacations, but they're short and kind of work vacations. Work related, you have yes. to find the, the, the needy, the needy in that area. Exactly, and do something out Are you serious? The mind is always thinking. And when we talk about helping people, nowadays we have learned how to help them virtually also. You don't need to be there physically. You're right. You're right. You can carry on, you know, doing whatever you love doing, helping people, you know, going out there. And you can even do that virtually and by other means. Yeah. And I've learned to do that and I've been doing that now. Yeah. And earlier on you spoke about exercising. So that the physical, mental, emotional well-being is also important um, towards the journey of, of life, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So in terms of exercising, one of the things that I've taken up recently is yoga. Ah. Uh, I've started doing yoga. And again, this was, I was inspired by my young daughter mm -hmm. who forced me that, Dad, let's go <laughs> and have a look at this yoga. But yoga has actually transformed my life uh, in terms of managing my health. Mm. Uh, I've been doing yoga three times a week. Uh, it's helped me with my knees, mm -hmm. uh, which were hurting. Okay. It's helped me to give me a little more flexibility in my body. And I don't know for some strange reason, after doing yoga, my sugar levels are perfect because I'm a diabetic. Oh, okay. So that's also helping me. Amazing. Could that be the reason why your daughter took up a, a lion's cause for the diabetic? For the diabetic, yes. She was inspired, uh, yes. of course, by me being a diabetic, my father, my brothers, a uh -huh. whole family of diabetics. <laughs> but you've overcome that. You've managed to yes. still rise. Yes. Still you rise. That's amazing. So the book officially launches today. Uh, you said yes. it's a family launch? Yes, we are having a family launch mm -hmm. of the book uh, today mm -hmm. and on the 31st of uh, July. Mm -hmm. And we have planned a grand launch on the 6th of August where we will officially be launching this to the media, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. to the world. And we're also doing a virtual worldwide launch uh, of wow. this book. Wow. Still so we have planned a number of events okay. between now and uh, the end of August to launch the book. Okay. And where will it be available? All bookstores? We have, uh, made, uh, we have made arrangements with Textbook Center. Mm. They are going to be the principal uh, suppliers okay. of this book mm -hmm. to anybody who wants to buy it. And the, the book is also available online. Uh -huh. It on will Amazon. be available online. Okay. Yes. Okay. Understood. It will be available online. So as we come to a close, uh, Dr. Shah, I don't know, whom should you advise today? Whom do you feel you need to speak to? I, I really want to speak to anybody and everybody out there. And uh, my parting message to all of you this evening is follow your dreams. All of us have dreams. We have an option of dreaming with our eyes closed and we have an option of dreaming with our eyes open. Follow your dreams with your eyes open, pursue them, and I can only assure you that your dreams will become a reality and they will actually be something that you will cherish for a lifetime. I like it, I like it. You have more? <laughs> uh, and basically, uh, my whole life journey is something that I hope will inspire many of you of what I have accomplished. If I can do it, I'm sure all of you can do it. Mm. And my last advice to each and every one of you is that though all of us have a little, but always make sure 
that we share whatever little that we have with the less fortunate and needy members of our society. Because I can only share with you and assure you that there are so many out there who are less fortunate than many of us who are viewing this program and in a much better place. So if we can do something for those who need our help, uh, that is the best gift that you can give to them. Mm. Thank you so, so much. Um, there's something, I know we're running out of time, but there's something I need you to speak to which you were very strong about in the book, and that's the power of gratitude. Yes. Mm -hmm. The power of gratitude is absolutely vital in anything and everything that you do. A simple thank you means a lot. The two words, thank you, means a lot to somebody that you are telling that to. And especially to the youth, to the young generation, gratitude means a lot. It means inspiration, it means motivation. And whenever you acknowledge, especially a young person, thank them, congratulate them, give them the best wishes on whatever they want to do, it means a lot to them. And gratitude plays a very big and critical role in the success of any individual. So I would like everybody to embrace gratitude as an everyday word and everyday feeling that they must do to anybody and everybody that they meet in their workplaces, at their, work, at their homes, and in anything and everything that they do. Hmm. Wow. Um, you have closed it on a very strong note. Yes. Thank you so, so much for you. availing your time to share just snippets of your story. Sure. Every bit of your story is in this legacy book, One in a Million. I promise when you read it, you'll understand the title because indeed uh, this gentleman is one in a million. Thank you for also giving Thank us the trademark hotel to do our program. My from. pleasure. We really appreciate it. And we can only just continue wishing you the best in your Thank endeavors. You. And to you watching, especially to the parents, the thing that stood out to me that was very powerful is the dream book um, that Dr. Shah had his daughters have when they were younger and a bit older. And I think that's really powerful. Uh, now we call them vision boards, but I think for kids, dream books are really powerful. So that's something to get. The show goes right up on YouTube uh, just after this. And you can also catch a repeat on Wednesday at 7 in the morning. Uh, for now, stay safe and stay grateful. <laughs>